Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, and issues from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening I'm joined by the author of the book Ecofascists, Elizabeth Nixon. And she's here all the way from Canada to share a little bit about ecofascism with us. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. And so tell us a little bit about you and uh, how you got started in writing and why the environmental uh, ecology kind of direction. Okay. Um, well, I, I was trained as a journalist at Time, Inc. in London. Uh, in the late 80s, and I worked uh, there for a couple of years, and then for, I was European Bureau Chief of Life magazine. And I consider myself an almost classically trained journalist, if such a thing were to exist, uh, middle of the road, mainstream, used to writing for um, the larger readership rather than a specialized or academic readership. So, uh, and I worked for every um, major broadsheet and magazine in the English-speaking world, I, in, in Canada, the UK, and the US. And in 1998, my father fell ill and he was dying. So I moved home to Salt Spring Island in Canada and I'd bought a piece of land, 30 acres of land, and I couldn't sell it, and I wanted to be at home to walk, keep, get my mother through this transition. So I built a little house, and it was at just at that point in um, human history that I could work for major magazines and newspapers from my little cottage at the top of a hill on Salt Spring Island. So I stayed, and um, at the time, I was, uh, I was sympathetic to the environmental movement. I didn't know very much about it, but I thought it was generally a good thing. And I started writing about it. And as a journalist who was classically trained, I would investigate. And some things seemed a little off, so I would write about that. And then the whole thing started, because any criticism I made, however lighthearted, or small was met with almost furious blowback. And because I lived on an island where the environment is taken very seriously, um, I got death threats and hate mail and, and, and phone calls in the middle of the night and lots mm -hmm. and lots of bad email. And every time this happened, I became further engaged. Mm -hmm. And at one point, about five years ago or ten, mm, seven years ago, I bought this 30 acres with a friend and in, in England, and he'd had a stroke at the age of 38, and he needed his money out of the land. And the only way I could do that was to shear off a piece and sell it and, and, uh, and give him the money. And that's when I ran into what I write about in Ecofascists, because the system that I endured um, over 22 months where I did not work because I was so occupied in making this happen that this 30-acre parcel in an island that's virtually uninhabited could be divided in half, took 22 months, cost $160,000. I had to hire five lawyers, four engineers, three surveyors. I covenanted half of the forest and I built a salmon enhancement pond at the intersection of my creeks. And I was basically, even though I agreed with some of this, I was basically extorted. And That's a term that comes up locally <laughs> here as well, where I you know. have to buy another piece of land or you have to t make tremendous modifications to your land in order to use it the way that you were originally intending yeah. or that you should have every right to use yeah. it for. So I was profoundly offended by this. And as a journalist, I wanted to know, was it happening in other places? Mm -hmm. And the more I looked, the more I found that it's happening everywhere. No matter where you look, in all over North America, in England, in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, the developing world, the same system has been put into place. And it acts to actually destroy economies, destroy the lives of rural people, and as I discovered, destroy the land itself. Well, the problem is, is that you used that 
classical training as a journalist as opposed to becoming a propagandist the way that everyone else has gone yeah. and just following along you actually put some thought into it and you researched and what did you find when you started to delve a little deeper I think f there were several shocking things that I found um, the first thing was that between 40 and 50 million rural Americans have been driven off their lands by the environmental movement since 1980 and you have to remember that since 1980 the population of the states has risen by a third so in fact many more people had that been possible would have moved to rural areas and 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 worked as ranchers farmers foresters or whatever um, and they've been driven into places like the Bay Area and uh, into stack and pack housing uh, at minimum wage jobs and uh, their lives have been drastically limited well in speaking to some of the, I'll use your term, eco-fascists <laughs> okay. that we experience here in the Bay Area, they say, well, it's not like we're putting guns to people's heads or anything. We're just doing what's right for the environment and for society by densifying these neighborhoods mm -hmm. or stack and pack, as you call them. I mm -hmm. call them human kennels, but it, <laughs> it, it, it is what it is. They're trying to move people out of the rural areas and out of even now the suburban areas and into these urban types yeah. of environments. Yeah. Their argument is we're not using a gun, so we're not doing anything wrong. When you say they're being driven from their land, talk to us. Give us examples okay. about what that well, means. It, it, I, there's a, there was a wonderful um, set of counties in southeast Colorado, and I'll use them for an example. Uh, it, and I, I spent some time with a rancher who was 74. He had 6,000 acres. And um, the first winter, what happened was a, there was a huge snowstorm. And all, uh, he, had, um, he was running 4,000 head of cattle, and 90% of them died. 90%. So what happened was that he built a state-of-the-art um, feed pen in uh, town so he could bring them all down and t shelter them. And the next year, a tornado blew through town and devastated his f It destroyed the town. It destroyed the town. Um, what the, the only offer on the table from the government were conservation easements on his property. And this happened to 300 landowners in this collection of counties that the conservation easements on their property were, were only, uh, only the gravel under the ground. They, they surveyed the ranches and they found gravel. Um, and those were taken away from the rancher and he got a tax deduction for it. A year later, the Colorado government disallowed those tax deductions and told the ranchers to pay back the money, but they couldn't have the gravel back. And by then it was 2008 when there was that huge stimulus bill and all the gravel under the ground could have been sold for a million dollars per easement to rebuild roads in Colorado and, and through the mountain states, but they were not allowed to use there. So that's, that kind of thing has happened and they're very small, they seem small, um, but they just leave people devastated. So this man, he was set, he's 74, he has been the mainstay of his county for his entire life. His family have ranched there forever. He's been ruined. He is servicing a debt that he said, you cannot believe it what my debt is and and he has been destroyed by the movement so that has happened I would say in tens of thousands of cases and when I did the research I did actual old-fashioned shoe leather reporting I got into my Jeep Liberty and I drove into the back country of America and uh, I would walk into a town a forest town in Northeast Washington State and I'd walk into the mayor's office and I'd say what's happening and she would often she and it was mo more often than not a woman who was you know nominated because nobody would run against her because nobody wanted the job she'd say we're dying we're a welfare county we used to be a strong working class community people had family wage jobs we had healthy schools healthy hospitals a healthy town and we have been destroyed 
And I heard that story over and over and over and over again. Is that story. destruction of the lumber industry? Or yeah, what that is? particularly, um, the spotted owl shut down the western forests and, uh, and basically destroyed the lives of millions of Americans. And in fact, as we know now, um, ecosystem management was put into place on those forests following the 93 shutdown by Clinton. And we now know because the western forest grows four times faster than any other temperate forest in the world, we can now audit the results of this. This is an, a magnificent experiment, in fact, because no, because the forest grows so fast and because they have been so um, vigilant at keeping their system in place, this ecosystem management conservation biology system, we now know that that forest is dying. Be, uh, because what they've done, they refuse any maintenance. So where 60 to 80 healthy trees once grow, grew, there's now four to 500 spindly trees. Their, their immune systems are weakened. Their root systems are tiny. They're, they have root rot. Um, they're depleting the nutrients in the soil, probably. Yeah, they're, they, they're vulnerable to pests. They're vulnerable to disease. They're vu vulnerable to fire and catastrophic canopy fire. So we now know that this thing that they have said to all of us, and many of us have believed it, is not only wrong, it's dead wrong. It's killing the forests and it's killing the ranges of America. Mm -hmm. And so it almost makes it sound like you're saying that the environmental movement, at least those components of it that are so tyrannical in their application, is actually detrimental as opposed yes. to a positive thing. Yes, and I think it's it's the reason for much of the hysteria in the movement because they've made so many really catastrophic mistakes that they cannot admit and they cannot have anyone shine the light onto it, that they just have this sort of haze of hysteria, the sky is falling, we have to do something now because that becomes the story. If too many people like me looked behind the screen and started peeling it back and seeing what what they've done, they would be, they would be beyond embarrassed. They'd be vilified. Well, the question is, are they really trying to hide mistakes? Yes. Or would you believe that in some cases it's more deliberate? Uh, or for anything other than environmental reasons that these people do what they do? You, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really know about the decision making that goes on in the higher reaches of the environmental movement. I do know that there uh, was an economist, an African economist, uh, Sir Arthur Lewis. He won the Nobel Prize in 1971 for this idea, which I believe is being prosecuted by the in movement now. He said that in the developing world, moving people out of the country into the cities was would not affect the rural economy at all and would in fact increase the vibrancy of the urban ac economy. So I think that the environmental movement actually believes that taking people out of what once was a vibrant rural American economy. I mean, it was the breadbasket of the world. It had mm -hmm. many innovations. I mean, it was a fantastic thing. And they, I don't think Arthur Lewis meant that you should destroy that. But they believe that moving people out of rural America into these megacities that they're creating is a good thing, and it's a good thing for the economy. Unfortunately, I, I believe they're, they're wrong. Well, there are aspects such as food production, if we really do care. Plants tend to cleanse the <laughs> air yeah. and create the oxygen we need and yes. process the CO2 that we don't, et cetera. Yeah. It's interesting that they would take that away. And if you look at the biodiversity studies that come out of the UN, for example, right. they would say that agriculture, livestock, meat eating, anything that would make people smile is generally not sustainable. <laughs> I know, but it's all just bunk, really, isn't it? I mean, uh, the, I think that, that, that nature needs man, just as man needs nature. Um, many of the, the farmers and, and ranchers that I met, they care deeply about their land, and when they are moved off of it, 
um, it turns to desert because nobody is looking after it. Those great big windmills that used to bring water up, from that would water their cattle and also wildlife for miles and miles around. They would maintain their fences, they would get rid of invasive weed, they would caretake their land. Mm -hmm. Now they, though, that, if you drive through central Oregon or um, Colorado or Idaho, wherever people have been moved off, it is desertifying. That land is deserted. There are just, I don't know, I mean, there's tens of thousands of abandoned buildings and stores and farms and ranches. It's a sad sight. It's a sad sight. Right. And so tell us a little bit about your book and the angle that it takes. And, and is there a solution for this madness? Um, hmm. Well, I think the first solution is for people to become more aware of what's going on. And, uh, and, then, um, and then, you know, they have to stand up. They have to stand up and say, no, this has to stop now. But I think that we have lost our civic skills as a people. We've um, handed our lives over to planners and to professionals, to bureaucrats who we felt um, had our best interests at heart. And I, I genuinely think that they think they have our best interests at heart. Unfortunately, they're making too many mistakes. They're making mistakes because they're not connected to the people that live in their, their communities. And unless we stand up and walk into their offices and say, no, this is not working for us, we have only ourselves to blame. And I, I'm, I think that's true of rural America as well. I think the, the problem is that they have been, they're isolated. Um, as you said earlier, they're connected now by the internet, and certainly everybody is uh, is talking about this. This is a ferment out there. More and more people are are saying we've got to we've got to take action. Um, so until but until they do, it's not going to change. Well, what, uh, may, maybe I'm just being myopic and seeing what's happening in the Bay Area. I think it becomes easier for people to become disjointed or dislocated yes. from the process. When they don't only when they don't actually own the property, yes. And because it's so expensive to live in the Bay Area and other parts of these mega cities, as you right. termed them earlier, yeah. that people don't have the vested interest to fight. That's right. And so, and as more and more of them lose their land in the rural areas or in the suburban areas and have no choice but to become renters or yeah. to to have so many of them living in one small location. That, that everyone has less of an emotional attachment to the piece exactly. of property. It makes it hard to, to keep people engaged in the fight. Exactly, that, that is such an important point. And that's why property rights are so, um, they're so vital that, that they, they give you, and that's what I discovered with my land. I loved that property so much that nobody was going to take that from me. I would fight for it and I would improve it and I would caretake it and, and, and I would do that for nothing that I rented. Right. S well, there's a reason why people say drive it like you rented it or drive it like you stole it. Because if it doesn't belong to <laughs> you, you can treat it badly. <laughs> but people do have a pride in ownership. Exactly. And when they lose that... Yeah, it, yeah. I think the, the future of, of megacities is not good. It, they're going. They're hot. They're crowded. There's too much crime. There's a lot of disease. There. It's a. It's a prescription for disaster. And, and, and we know that. I mean, the studies of Portland and the inner city rail. That nobody uses it. They're still in their cars. No matter where you look with megacities, they are not working. They're. They're not working. And densification. If you try to move. Um, densification into a neighborhood that has roots, everybody rejects it. They say, no, you've got to stop it. They tried it in Vancouver and, and, and it just didn't work. People stood up at meetings and said, you, no. They just said no. Yes. We've had similar things with Plan Bay Area here and yeah. even with the, in, the planner's own documentation, it shows that it's a more dangerous way to live, yeah. but they still continue to implement, I whether know. it's because they believe that it's best for the citizenry, the citizenry doesn't know any better, they'll eventually like it once they get used to it, whatever. Yeah. It, it becomes a mess and we literally had thousands of people standing up in protest and saying no. There's some disheartened folks in the Bay Area because they did it anyway. Yeah. 
And yeah, you've got a monster bureaucracy here, don't you? We do, but uh, you know, one of the things in talking to you and to others that are tracking this nationally, you alluded to it earlier. It's not just a Bay Area thing, it's no. a national thing, it's an international thing. Yeah. And so give us some of the bright spots that you might have seen as you've been traveling around. Give us hope here for the beleaguered <laughs> Bay Area and to feel like there is none. Well, there is a, a, there. I mean, you've got Pacific Legal Fund coming on after me and they are doing magnificent work, I think. And uh, um, then they won a, a case at the Supreme Court level that was was amazing. That said, you can no longer extort benefits from a property owner in return for de development rights. I mean, that has happened tens of thousands of times. And it happens regularly in the Bay Area. In fact, it's demanded up front. That's astonishing. So these legal wins are very important. There's a, a lawyer in Idaho called Fred Kelly Grant who's just uh, got received uh, significant funding to do something that he discovered in the law called coordination that reaches right back to the first Continental Congress of the United States, um, which says that that a county government is uh, has equal standing with state and federal bureaucrats and must be um, it must be appeased. The economy and culture of a county is just as important as any rule that the state wants to bring in and often and he has not won lost any battles and equally American stewards in Texas whenever they take a case to court and it does take a lot of work they find that the environmental movement and the EPA and all of the various agencies they do not have their science right the science is always corrupt and that's always corrupt and they don't do their paperwork right because the paperwork that they this proliferation of paperwork is so immense that nobody can get it right so they can win on that so there there are all kind I, mean, I think there's a, a wonderful um, uh, thing that happens in people when they start standing up against these people it, it's a it's a it's a a benefit of adulthood and and it, it's it's lovely to see well partially speaking for myself it's therapeutic to go and yell at some yes. people uh, <laughs> out in public but additionally I think that we have a responsibility when we see these things that are going wrong to stand up yeah because even if we individually lose that particular fight yeah we give someone else permission to misbehave as well. Yeah. And when that happens, it empowers people yes. and they can take control back over their yes. lives. Yes, and you bring your whole adult self. You know, you're not you're you're not a whining child stamping your foot. You you bring your adult self to the meeting and you can make significant gains. Well, especially because some of the bureaucracy that's implanted they they put it right out there what they plan to do to you, at least oh, in the yeah. cases of what we've seen here in the Bay Area. And when they do that, it's easy to call them on it yes. for the things that they're doing. It's easy to call out. I mean, some of them have very racist overtones in the way that they're trying to group people, which was one of our experiences Ugh. here. Uh, and their environmental impact reports show the danger of it all. Really? So I if people actually do the research, what they find is that these things are defeatable, or at least you can publicly shame the people, again, to make yourself feel better. Yeah. So we just have a couple of minutes left. Tell us a little bit more about how people can find out information about you and the book. Well, I don't know how interesting I am, but the book <laughs> is, uh, the book, the book is, it, it was deliberately written so that it was easy to understand. It's enormously complex what's happened. Um, because uh, one thing that we forgot to talk about is how much land has been locked away in the states and I reckon by the end of 2014 or by the end of Obama's second term you will have half of the 2.2 billion acres in the US are going to be locked down and put off limits that's 1.1 billion acres have been set aside. So that is an extraordinary amount of land kind that's of been taken out of Americans' hands. Um, is, so, so the whole system that's been created in this book, because it's got this narrative of my, me fighting and actually winning my battle, uh, I, it's a, I managed to open up the uh, the science, how much land has been, how many people have been driven, wh why the ranges and forests are dying, all of that is is easy to understand. Okay. So that's 
And can they find out more about it at elizabethnixon.com? Yes. For that note, uh, we do have to take a quick break for a word from our underwriter, the, the Conservative Forum. But thank you for joining us, Elizabeth. My pleasure. The Conservative Forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And welcome back to The Right Side. That was a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. And although we're immensely thankful for them underwriting the show, they're, what they're best known for is their speaker series. The reason we were lucky enough to have Elizabeth join us on the show this evening is that she will be speaking this evening at the Conservative Forum at 432 Stirling Road at the IFES Hall, about three minutes from here in Mountain View. Uh, normally, the show starts at 7 o'clock until uh, around 8.30 or so, but just so you know what's coming up in October, Robert Spencer, the director of jihadwatch.com, will be uh, speaking in November on the 5th, Senator Jim DeMint, uh, with now with the Her Heritage Foundation. In December 3rd, we have Michael Ramirez, who is an editorial cartoonist. As, and then on January 7th, Evan Sayet is an author and political satirist that will be joining us. And in February, Victor Davis Hanson. If you haven't had a chance yet to find out what's happening in the environmental movement and how in some cases it's not an environment that is uh, benefiting from some of the tactics that are being utilized, as Elizabeth uh, noted as we spoke, uh, please do do your research. And as she said, get active. Stand up for your rights. Not only will it empower you and works great therapeutically, <laughs> but it will also empower other people to defend themselves and their rights too. Because after all, you've worked for it. It's worth fighting for. Thanks for joining us this evening on The Right Side. We'll look forward to seeing you again in person or on the show sometime soon. Thanks.